The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. We're in a series called Mixtape. And I'm going to ask our, there you go, thank you. We're in a series called Mixtape, and we're walking through the book of Psalms. We're not studying every psalm, but we're getting the big epic picture and understanding that God, in his word, inspired by his Holy Spirit, 150 songs. So, so Psalms is a collection of songs, and there is a song for every occasion of life. I read a psalm this morning. I'd never noticed it. it actually, it's a song for a wedding day. And it actually has words to the bride and words to the groom in the psalm. There's a psalm for everything. In a time of sadness, there's psalms that help us express our heart to God. In times of incredible joy, there's psalms for that. And there are psalms, like you just heard, for times of fear. When you realize that, boy, I'm struggling with fear. And I don't want to be fearful. I want to be fearless. I want to live in boldness and confidence. And, and how do I live in that kind of boldness and confidence if, if in a world where things aren't always perfect, where there are real challenges and real dangers. And, and all through history, people have sung songs about, about the idea of not being afraid. There was a song written in 1976, a rock band wrote a song, 1976, hit the, it's, Rolling Stones puts in the top 500 rock songs in all of history, and you might recognize, in, in a moment, you're going to hear a little bit of this song, you might recognize it, you might not, but it's one of the few rock songs in all history that features this instrument, the cowbell. The song is called, Don't Fear the Reaper. And it talks about, don't fear death, don't fear the reaper. Live your life. If you listen closely. I can play this thing all day, but I won't. Uh, but, but this song actually features the cowbell. And, and the whole song is, is just saying, don't live in fear of death. And a lot of people live in fear of a lot of things. What I want to ask you to do is I want you to think for a minute, what is it? that causes fear in my heart. We're, I don't want you just to think about it and dwell on it. I want you to think about it and understand that, that we gather today to worship a God who can take away your fear, a God who can make you fearless, less fearful, and with time, fear less. But what is it that kind of, that kind of in the back of your mind, the back of your heart kind of, kind of wanders around creating fear for you? There's been lots and lots of studies done on the kinds of things that people fear, uh, actually, the uh, Washington Post uh, years ago did a study, and they came up with just some of the ordinary stuff, and there's a list of all kinds of ordinary things that people deal with in fears, fears of height, public speaking, lots of people afraid of public speaking, bugs, snakes, drowning, blood, needles, claustrophobia, you know, closed spaces, flying, strangers, zombies, uh, <laughs> darkness, and clowns were some of the, just the things that just ordinary people, and all those are legitimate except for maybe one, I think, that the uh, zombies. Clowns are real, zombies are not. Um, but but those, for some people, those cause fears. Well, then, as time's gone by, Chapman University did a study because what they're finding out is there's a whole layer of new fears that people have that weren't fears before. With time, with changing of culture, with development of technology, there's all kinds of new things to be afraid of. So let me just help you think of some more fears, just for those that are already getting anxious. Why did I come today? I'm getting all nervous. Just here's some new fears. Uh, this has probably been around a long time, but you know, corrupt government officials. That's bipartisan. People are just afraid of government in a lot of ways. Terrorist attacks. Massive place of fear for many people. Um, financial issues and even economic collapse on a national or global level. People are like, man, I'm afraid that the whole economic system could fall apart. Identity theft. A lot of people, and, and if you've gone through that, you know why people fear it. It's, it's, a, it's a scary thing. Corporate tracking of my personal information. 
via they always know where they am. There's all these different things. You go, man, now I'm starting to feel creeped out. I'm kind of feeling afraid and nervous. And why are we talking about this? Well, we're talking about this because we gather to worship a God who, who, who moves beyond that. We're all afraid of something, in some cases more than one thing, but here's what the Bible teaches us. We can live a fearless life. You can live a life that's not dominated by fear. And people write songs about that. People have written songs about how do you, you, know, how do you get the right attitude, the right outlook to be courageous, to be bold, to not be dominated by fear. And, and a singer, uh, Megan Trainer, wrote a song that has 188 million views on YouTube. 188 million views. And her solution, her idea for getting beyond kind of fear, living a bold life, is just start dancing. So I'm going to just show you what that means. Brace yourselves. Okay, that's it. Um, but for, 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 for some people, and you know what's interesting is that this idea, if you just dance and sing, it'll make you feel better and you won't be so afraid. The psalm we're going to look at today has a little bit of that feel to it at moments. It talks about singing and praising God. It's directing not just kind of dancing, but, but focusing your eyes upwards. But there's something about an attitude of joy that we're going to see in this psalm that goes, goes beyond just living and dwelling in our fears. And, and so I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 27. If you have your Bible with you, sermon Psalm, Psalm 27. And this entire psalm is a song given by God in his collection of songs, his mixtape of songs that's all about living a fearless life, overcoming fear. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the idea of, of why we can live a fearless life, where we can live a fearless life, and then how do we get there? How do we grow in fearlessness? So let's start in Psalm 27, verses one through three. Listen to the heart of David, who knew a lot about attacks and problems and challenges. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. Oh God, speak to us today. Whatever fear we might face, small or large, legitimate or strange, whatever it is, may, may we learn to overcome fear because of the power of Jesus and the confidence we have in your name, O oh God. Speak to us and give us boldness and courage and a fearless spirit this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, keep your Bible open. If you have it open in front of you, keep it open to Psalm 27 because we're going to walk through this psalm, through the message today, and we're going to learn about this topic of growing to live a fearless life. So, why can I live a fearless life? I'll say, first of all, what the psalmist doesn't say is he doesn't say, hey, if you love Jesus and you go to church, then all the bad things in the world will go away. And you can be fearless because there's nothing to fear. If you look closely at David's words, he says, though an army besiege me, the war come against me. His fearlessness is not because there's nothing to fear. Now, wouldn't it be nice to say, well, if I love Jesus, there'll never be another thing to fear in all my life. Everything will be secure till I go to heaven someday. But that's not what it says. It says confidence and boldness and fearlessness don't come because there's nothing to fear, but there's something else going on. So why? Why can I live a fearless life, according to David in Psalm 27? Well, number one, and if you're, if you're a note taker, this is where you pull out your bulletin. You got a place to kind of jot a few thoughts down to remember the key ideas. If you're not a note taker, don't worry about it. But if you want to take notes, it's there for you. Why can I live a fearless life? Number one, because God is my light, so I don't Fear the darkness. Look at verse one. The Lord is my light. We can live a fearless life because we walk in the light of a living God. If you're a Christian, you walk in the light of Jesus Christ. If you've traveled to other parts of the world or even just traveling around in our own, in our, where we live here, there's certain places that are dark. Not just physically dark. I'm talking about spiritually um, there's places you can walk into certain places and you can feel a blanket of darkness. Does, do some of you know what I'm talking about? Uh, we've had a team, teams of people go to different parts of the world for ministry. I know a couple of our teams that have gone over to, uh, to Kat, the city of Kathmandu 
Pastor Roy went there with a team, and, and, and he, it, it, people will tell you, you walk into that place and you can feel, I mean, it's, it's a place with beautiful you know, landscapes and mountains and wonderful people, but there's this spiritual blanket of darkness, and you can almost taste it in the air, you can almost feel it, your soul just goes, man, there's something not right here. And yet Pastor Roy would tell you, there's little hubs of the light of Jesus shining in these little Awana clubs and these churches all around Kathmandu in this dark place. There's a shining light of Jesus. So whether you're afraid of physical darkness, I mean, if you're afraid of the dark at night and you know Jesus, just say, the light of Jesus is with me. And you can hold to that. That will help you overcome. But beyond that, to spiritual darkness, to, to social, to, 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 to relational darkness, in the dark places, let God be your light. Jesus himself said, he said, I am the light of the world. He said, when we become his followers, we become the light of the world. So we can shine the light of Jesus. And, and so I want to challenge you, wherever you go, when you see darkness, say, Jesus, I walk in your, if you're a Christian, say, I walk in your light and you're the light of the world and you live in me, so shine your light. And boy, the presence of God's people in dark places brings the light of Jesus. Why can I live a fearless life? Because God is my light so I don't fear the darkness. And then again in verse one, a next thing. Why can I live a fearless life? Because God is my salvation so I don't fear eternity. I don't fear death. I don't fear when this life ends because God is my salvation. Verse one of Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Boy, David says God is our savior and when you know his salvation, you have a strength for now and for eternity. It's amazing. And some of you go, well, yeah, I grew up around the church. When you say God's my salvation, I know what that means. As followers of Jesus as Christians, we're on the other side of the cross when Jesus came and entered human history. We're on the other side of the empty tomb where Jesus rose from the dead. We understand something called the gospel. The gospel, that word gospel means good news. And as Christians, we believe the gospel. And there's lots of ways to explain the gospel, and I could spend hours and hours talking about what the gospel is, but let me give you this simple understanding of the gospel in eight words. I'm gonna share this in greater depth at a night of worship coming up down the line. But I can tell you the entire gospel in eight words. And it's almost like a little ping pong game where it goes back and forth between God and us, God and us. You understand the gospel? Here, here's the gospel, the good news of God in eight words. This is the message of salvation in eight words. First two words, God's love. God loves us. He knows everything about us, all our wrongs, all of our bad thoughts, all of our bad actions. He knows everything the Bible calls sins. He knows them all and he still loves us. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God, the first part of the gospel is this, God's love. That's the first two words, remember that. It all begins with the love of God. Next two words, our problem. Back to us, God, us, God, us. God's love, our problem. Our problem is called sin. We think things we shouldn't think, we say things we shouldn't say, we do things we shouldn't do, and all these things, all these sins, they separate us from God. And we can't get back to God in our own power. That's our problem. We're separate from God because of our sins. And our sins become like the Grand Canyon and we're here and God's here and we can't jump and we can't get back. First two words, God's love. God totally loves us, even in our brokenness. Next two words, our problem, sin, it separates us. Now back to God again. Next two words, God's solution. God's solution. You know what the solution is? Jesus. God left heaven and came among us, Emmanuel, Jesus, God with us. That's Christmas. He lived a life with no wrong and no sin. And then Jesus died on the cross for our sins, for our wrongs. And he took all the punishment and all the shame and all the judgment we deserved. And Jesus took it on himself. And he paid the price and he died in our place. And they buried him. And three days later, he rose again from the grave. Alive and victorious. That's God's solution. Jesus Christ. You getting the story? That's six words. God's love. Our problem, God's solution, back to us. Last two words, our response. What do we do with it? God offers forgiveness. He offers new life. He offers salvation. Good news. And we either say, no, thank you, I don't want it. Or, oh, man, if you offer that to me, I'll receive it. And when you receive Jesus... You receive his grace, his love, his friendship, and you receive the one who will live in you and now lead you all the days of your life. He becomes the one who saves you and the one who leads you the rest of your life. That's the whole story in eight words. You got it? 
God's love, our problem. God's solution, our response. At the close of the service today, if you've never come to that response and said, I receive Jesus, I'm going to give you a chance to pray and receive Jesus today. I'm not going to pressure you. I'm not going to belabor it and do 14 verses of a song until you, you know, somebody comes down the aisle. I'm going to just let you right where you are. If you want to receive Jesus, you can do that and you can pray to receive him because I can't pressure anyone to receiving Jesus, but the Holy Spirit can draw your heart. So before we close the service, I want you to know, I'm going to give you a chance to pray and say, Jesus, I received the price you gave on the cross. But, but the psalmist says, God is my salvation. And if you're a Christian, a follower of Jesus, you can say, God is my salvation. So you know what? I don't fear life or death or anything beyond death. Why? God has saved me through Jesus. Isn't that good news? That's the good news of the gospel. Why can I live a fearless life? Because I know God's salvation, and no one can take that from me. You can take a lot of things from me. You cannot take the salvation of Jesus. So I can stand confident in that. Number three, why can I live a fearless life? Because God is my stronghold, so I don't fear attacks. Boy, the, just that reality that God is our stronghold, he protects us. He is our fortress, he is our stronghold, he is our mighty tower. And sometimes you, you might say, well, I'm following Jesus, and I follow Jesus, and I know he's on the throne, and I know that God rules the universe, but I don't feel protected. I mean, I feel like I'm in this crazy world where there's dangers and problems, and, and there's even times, and I want to be honest with you now, we have these thoughts, there's times where God does not behave like I think God should behave. Do you know what I'm saying? God, if I was you, I would have fixed that. If I was you, I would have healed that. If I was you, I wouldn't have let that happen. And if we're honest, we, we look and say, God, there's times where you don't behave the way I think you should behave, so I don't know if I trust you anymore. Here's the dilemma that I face. I have this profound sense, and I'll be honest with you, that God might be smarter than me. I live with this reality that the God of the universe might know more than I know. So as I go through life, there's times where I face a situation or someone else I love is going through something and I, and I pray and I say, God, I want you to fix this. I want you to change. And I, and I ask, I try to humbly and boldly ask God, will you do this? Will you do that? And sometimes God doesn't do what I ask. Does anybody else experience that before? Where God doesn't exactly do everything you say he should do, right? I've had that experience. And there's times where I don't understand why. And then a month, a year, 10 years go by and I'll look back and I'll say, oh, God, you were so wise. What I wanted wasn't the right thing. But there's other times in my life where I've really thought God should have kind of conducted himself in a different way, and I still haven't seen the why. And I don't think until I see him face to face, I'll understand. But can I say, the Lord is my fortress, my stronghold, and my protector, even when he doesn't always do what I think he should do? Do I believe that all the universe is in his hand? And he's really on the throne. And if I believe that, I'm going to do my best to trust him. And trust that he's, God, if I was you, I'd protect me differently. But God says, I'm on the throne. Trust me. And there's times where we say, and yet God is my protector. God is my stronghold. I don't fear attacks. Even though it seems like I feel exposed at times, I trust that God's still on the throne. And he'll make things right in the end. So God is my light. God is my salvation. God is my stronghold. We're just walking through, through Psalm 27 here. And then number four, why can I live a fearless life? Because God is my victory, so I don't fear defeat. That God is the one who's won the victory. I believe with all my heart that on the cross, Jesus Christ broke the power of sin and hell and death and bore my sins and washed them away. And when I received him, I was made new and he has won the victory. I believe that with all my heart. And I think that's what David is saying, and we understand as Christians, is that through Jesus Christ, God has won the final victory. But like every war, any war in history, when the war is over, when somebody surrenders, it takes time for the little skirmishes to end. I mean, the war has been won, and someone has been declared a victor. But they're still kind of mopping up afterwards. There's things being cleaned up. That's the time we live in. When Jesus came out of that grave, when Jesus, you know, on the cross, paid for our sins, broke the power, power of the enemy, came from the, Dave and, from the grave and broke the power of sin and death, when all that happened, the battle was over. The victory is won. And Jesus wins. Someone say amen. amen. Jesus won the battle. Now, but, but in some ways you feel like Satan hasn't totally got the memo, hasn't got the whole understanding. So there's still little skirmishes going on, but we know who's won the war. 
If you're a follower of Jesus, you can walk through life and say, I walk in the victory of Jesus. No matter what I see around me, I know that he has won the victory. So there's reasons why we can walk a fearless life. Next question, where? Where can I be fearless? What are the settings of life? Where can I go where I can actually be bold and confident? Look with me at Psalm 27, verses 4 and 5. I want you to notice that David is, is clearly thinking about a specific place where you can go and be confident and be fearless if you can go to a certain place. Try to kind of, in your, in your mind, get a sense of where that is. Verse 4. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Do you see what's going on here? If you know some biblical history, you know that in the ancient time for the Jewish people, they had the tabernacle, which was sort of a traveling worship center they could travel and take with them, set up, and it was the center of their community because God was the center of their community. And, and they believed that God dwelt in the very, in, in the holy place of that tabernacle. And eventually they built a temple, which was built after the same kind of structure of the tabernacle, but made out of stone instead of cloth. And again, there was this most holy place where they said God dwells here. So David is saying... When there's troubles and there's fear and there's battles and I'm struggling, if I can just get myself over to the temple or the tabernacle, if I can get there where God is, I'll be safe. He's saying, I, I need to get near to where God is. But we understand on this side of the cross of Jesus and the, and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that God doesn't dwell in a tabernacle or a temple. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 17, and note takers, you can write down Acts 17, 24, we read this. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. David is saying, we don't, at, 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 at this, I'm sorry, not David speaking, but the writer of Acts is saying, Luke is saying, we understand that God doesn't dwell in physical places anymore. Well, so then if God doesn't dwell in a tabernacle or a temple, the question is, where does he, where does he dwell? We'll look at 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, we read this. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred. But what's he talking about? And you together are that temple. What the Apostle Paul is saying to the church of Corinth is he's saying, listen, when you gather like this as God's people, God dwells among you. Where can I run that's safe? Where can I run where I'm near God? Be among God's people. Because God dwells in a unique way among his people. But he goes beyond that in chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. He says, not only does God dwell among you, but God dwells in you. He's among you when you gather, but he's in you when you're scattered. Look at verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. That's the death of Jesus on the cross. You were purchased, bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? Now think about this. David is saying, I got to get to the temple. I got to get to the tabernacle because that's where God is. I'll be safe there. But what we learn now is God doesn't dwell in buildings built by human beings. Where does he dwell? Among his people and community and among his people wherever you go. So, you're facing a trouble, you're facing a problem, you're struggling, and you're in the line at Costco waiting to pay for your stuff. Your boxes and crates of food, right? And, you're there. and guess what? God's there. God's at, wait, God's at Costco? That's the new temple, the new holy of holies? Well, no, but God's there because you're there. And he dwells in you. You go to your workplace and there's tension, there's problems. You go, God, I gotta get somewhere where I can meet with God. He's there at your school on your campus. Oh, but wait, there's separation of church and state. God's not allowed on my campus. Oh, guess what? God's there because you're there. He lives in you. This is the, this is the reality. So, so, so David says, well, where 
Can I be fearless? And here's the answer. If you're a follower of Jesus, God lives in you. You're the temple of God. You are fearless whenever you're, you're anywhere near the temple of God. Guess what? You can't leave the temple of God because it's you. And then when you gather together with lots of people who dwell with the Spirit in them like this, in a unique, powerful way, God is here. You can be fearless anywhere you go. So then the final question, how can I grow a fearless heart and life? If there's reason to be, reasons to be fearless, if I can be fearless anywhere, how do I nurture, how do I grow an attitude of bold confidence in living for God? Well, let's continue with Psalm 27 because David unfolds that. He says, uh, beginning in verse 6, he says, then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. And again, he's not saying the enemies are gone. He's just saying God will lift me above them. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, for you have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your ways, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. Boy, David is not saying life is perfect. He's still got people around him speaking lies. He's still got people attacking him. But he says, I'm going to grow to be bold and confident and fearless. Why? Because God is my light and God is my salvation and God is my stronghold and God is my victory. And he lives in me and anywhere I go, I'm with him. So I'm going to grow more and more confident in who I am in a, as a follower of Jesus. How can I grow a fearless heart and life? In this passage, the first thing we see is this. Believing that God will lift you above your enemies, even the worst enemies. Do you believe that God is on the throne? And you, do you believe that he will deliver you and watch over you? Even the greatest enemy, Satan, who will try to find any way to lie and steal and destroy. And even though God's won the victory, Satan's still around in these little skirmishes trying to mess with our lives. And if you want to walk in bold confidence, you have to understand. You have to, to live in a way that says, I believe that God is going to give me victory over my enemies. When you feel the ultimate enemy, Satan, coming against you, you say, he who is in me, Jesus, is greater than the one who's in the world. Jesus is greater than the enemy. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I will stand in bold confidence. And even in this life, when people come against me, and some of David's enemies were just people, were other nations, other people that were attacking him, individuals in his own family, trying to throw him off the throne. I mean, he had all kinds of attacks coming at him. And he said, yet I trust in God. He's clear that he trusts in God and he's confident in the God who he worships. Will you walk through life saying, whatever comes my way, I know that God has won the victory. How do I grow a fearless heart in life? Number two, Developing a lifestyle of worship and joy at all times and in all places. There is this sense for a follower of Jesus that wherever you go, God is with you. So go in joy and go in confidence and go in hope and go singing praises to God wherever you go. Do you know that Christians are singing people? I didn't know that when I became a Christian. That was something God had to teach me later. As a younger person, before I was a Christian, I liked music. I liked listening to some music. I didn't really like singing. I didn't want to sing, and I didn't like, my sisters were like in madrigals and different choir things, and it was almost like a punishment. My parents would make me go to their choir things and just sit there, oh. And I didn't enjoy it, but when I became a Christian, I read all these things in the Bible about singing to God. You know that the Bible calls Christians to sing to God more than it talks about the virgin birth of Jesus? I believe Jesus was born of a virgin. Which means I also have to believe the Bible keeps telling me, sing, sing, sing a new song, sing a song, sing with all your heart, sing, sing, sing. I got to the point where I'm like, I don't like to sing. And God basically said in my heart, I don't care. Because he's God, he can do that. I'm like, okay, I'm going to sing, but I don't think you're going to like it. And he loves it, it turns out. <laughs> um, at least that's what he told me. Um, and I don't care what you think. But, but, but for some of us, some of you who follow Jesus, you've never learned to sing. 
You're still where I was back when I was just like, I don't, but I don't like to sing. And you need to hear God say to you, but I delight when you sing. And it does something in your soul. Whether you like the old hymns and you just want to sing, oh, a mighty fortress is our God, or whether you like the 1970s and 80s Maranatha praise music, you know, I will call upon the Lord. I was so happy. You know, and, or whether it's the newer stuff, it doesn't matter what the tune is, just sing praise to God. And in a minute when I finish this message, we're, gonna, we're doing this new thing where we can do a little bit of singing at the beginning of the service, and then at the end, we're going to have a giving back song. Then we're gonna, after that giving back song, we're going to sing two songs together. If you can do the math, that's one giving back song, two songs, that's three songs. Hang in there, okay? If you're not a big singer person, will you just say, God, if singing praise to you will strengthen me to have courage and boldness, I want to learn to live that way, I want to praise you. And start learning to sing praise to God. So number two, develop a lifestyle of worship and joy. And then number three, crying out consistently to God for his presence, his power, and his help. In Psalm 27, David says, I will seek your face. He prays, God, teach me your ways. God, lead me in your path. He's crying out to God, God, make me strong. Teach me how to live. Give me courage. Help me seek your face. He's asking God, help me be bold. You can do that. There's a word for that when you say to God, help me be bold. Help me be strong. Lead me in your ways. There's a word for that. You know, it's called prayer. That's prayer. God, give me strength. Help me. And I want to challenge you. Start talking to God. Say, God, in this situation, I feel afraid. Give me boldness. In this situation, I don't feel joy. Give me joy. In this situation, I don't like to sing. Help me sing, whatever it is. Cry out to God. But we grow in our courage. We grow in our boldness. We grow fearless when we cry out to God. And so I want to challenge you. Ask God to grow your courage in your faith. And then David finishes this psalm with these beautiful words. In verses 13 and 14, he says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then this invitation, listen to this. Wait for the Lord. Be strong, take heart, and wait for the Lord. Hold on to God, whatever fear you face. Know that when he's with you, and he's always with you if you're a Christian, that there's light and life, and salvation, and victory. Walk in that, live in that, and shine that light. Lord Jesus, we pray that you will teach us how to walk and live in courage and in boldness for your glory. I pray, oh God, that right now, as we give back, as as we worship you through giving from what you've given to us, we would be fearless in our generosity. Lord, it's so easy to, to not give because we are worried and anxious and fearful that we won't have what we need. And I thank you for the journey of call that we've been on as a church for many people I've talked to who have taken a next step of generosity and you've provided and amazed them and now they're bold for the next step. Help us be fearless in every area, including trusting you to provide for us. As we give back now, let it be an act of worship.